Notice that the, the title here is sure to bring the uh, Department of Homeland Security after us, right? Not only that, notice that I am a core member of ISIS, the Institute for Computation <laughs> Engineering and Sciences. Okay? So, um, yeah. And I'm recording this, so uh, somebody can tell me later. Okay, so, uh, conveniently, I am the speaker, and therefore I get to define things my way, and hopefully we won't discuss too much, so we'll actually get to what the bulk of this uh, talk is supposed to be about. But let's start by my, with, let's start with my favorite definition of science, which is knowledge that has been reduced to a system. What do you do in physics? You putzy around some, you gain some insight, you make this systematic with a theorem or a theory, and then you come back and you do some more experiments to support the theory and off you go. And the nice thing about this particular uh, definition, which I encourage you to embrace, is that it defines computer, it means that as computer scientists we can claim to be the pure science of all. Right? Because what do we do? We take things and we make them so systematic that we can get a computer to do it for us. It's the only proof that really, that it really proves that we really understand it, because now it's mechanical, the computer can do it. No. So if anybody ever asks, why is computer science a science anyway, you can now sort of say, well, go watch this video by Van de Guy. Uh, right? And then here we have a, a famous Texan, appropriately in burnt orange, right? And who is that? That's Dijkstra himself. And from his uh, Turing Awards uh, acceptance uh, talk, uh, we see this bit of wisdom here. The only effective way to raise the confidence level of a program significantly is to get a convincing proof of its correctness. Uh, I should do this the way that I should say it. But one should not first make the program and then prove its correctness. Anyway, you can imagine. <laughs> because then the requirement of providing the proof would only increase the poor program's burden. On the contrary, program the programmer should let correctness prove the program grow hand. So how many of you program this way? <laughs> how many of you have proven a program correct before you ever ran? How many of you then had that program give the right answer the first time? <laughs> All right? How many would be willing to put a hundred dollars down saying I know it's gonna give the right answer the first time? <laughs> right? Well that's the level of confidence we should all have, right? Now, what I'm going to try to convince you of is that if you actually follow Dijkstra's uh, wishes, then you too can get there. Uh, but the, the tricky part is that in my field, we invariably do things with loop-based programs. Okay? One thing is that a lot of people went into functional languages where presumably this is a little bit easier to apply. Now, we need to have loop-based algorithms because we want to march through matrices uh, with granularity that obeys the caches, and this has a huge impact on uh, performance. So we need to be able to derive loop-based algorithms, programs, to be correct hand-in-hand -hand with the proof of correctness. That's what we're after. And the question is, can we do this for something like the entire Denslinia Alpha software stack, which you know, is about two million lines of code? about 70% of which traditionally is in test routines that try to establish that everything is correct. Right. <clears throat> so, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about the FLAME program uh, for a, a FLAME project. That's the, the project that uh, I've led for the last uh, 15 years or so. Um, but then we're going to get into the good stuff where it's going to start with notation, and from there we're going to get into the weapon of math induction, and then everything will sort of start falling in place. Right. So let's just get started, because I've already wasted a lot of time with this introduction. So, in our group we actually do a lot of different things. And a lot of people uh, in my field were sort of say, well, what's flame anyway? Is flame a library? Is flame a notation? Is flame a derivation method? Methodology, etc. And actually, it's all of that. So it's, it's everything from a new notation for expressing algorithms to uh, very high performing libraries that actually are being used by vendors and being distributed by, for example, AMD, ARM, and Texas Instruments, etc. 
But the key insight really started with our ability to formally derive algorithms to be correct. And why this is really important for us will become clear as I talk about uh, various subjects. Now, we are known for high performance. <laughs> and invariably, we forget to put a high performance graph in our talks. And therefore, here it is. We get excellent performance. Just say, yes, we see that. And then we don't ever have to talk about performance again. Uh, what do we have here? On the left, we have a, an Intel Xeon Phi, which has 60 cores on the chip. And uh, the upshot of this is that we managed to get better than 80% of peak on matrix matrix multiplied on 60 cores running on 240 threads. Okay? And if that doesn't wow you, then nothing will. Because that actually is impressive. And we essentially match the performance that Intel gets with an entire army of people working on this. Um, so, I'm not going to talk about performance again. We understand performance. Um, therefore, we don't need to mention it. We have a whole bunch of papers you can go read if you really want to know about how we achieve performance and how well we understand this. Okay, so we're going to focus on the science that underlies what we do. <clears throat> and it all starts with notation. Um, and I'm going to illustrate this with a motivating example, the Kolesky factorization. And um, as graduate students in computer science, presumably you've taken a course in linear algebra at some point, and often the Kolesky factorization is an example used in classes. But let me sort of remind you of what it is. If A has a certain special property, symmetric positive definiteness, um, then uh, that matrix A, which is a square matrix, can be factored into a lower triangular matrix times its own values. And that turns out to be an important operation. But for our purposes, this is just to illustrate the methodology. I like leading off with a concrete example. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we could go to the whiteboard, doodle a little bit, explain an algorithm to each other, and then have the doodle on the whiteboard become the algorithm, and then also become the code that implements it? Wouldn't code become much more readable then, and wouldn't the world be much better? So when we talk about matrices on, at the whiteboard, what do we do? We, we put a big square on the whiteboard and say, that's a matrix. And then we say, oh, and what you really do is you think of different parts of that matrix here while isolating a single element in the top left. And then you have the rest of that row, the rest of that column, and the rest of the matrix. And then for the Kolesky factorization, you end up taking the square root of that element and dividing the result of that into the rest of that column. And then you do an outer product that you then subtract off of matrix A22. And at that point, um, you say, oh, and now we need to do a Kolesky factorization of this remaining matrix. And therefore, we move forward. And now the thick line here indicates where we are in the matrix. The TL stands for top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. And you partition again, you take the square root, you update, you update, you move forward, and you can sort of see how I now illustrate this. Okay. Now, if that's how we explain the algorithm to each other, why do we often implement this you know, where we have to mess around with index ranges and things like that? Okay. That doesn't really capture how we explain it to each other. So maybe we should try to explain and typeset algorithms this way. And what happened in, oh, a little bit before the year 2000, the last millennium, before some of you were born. Well, maybe not quite, right? Um, we came up with this notation for explaining algorithms. And what's going on? You start by partitioning the matrix into uh, four quadrants, where some of the quadrants are empty. And then you get into the loop, you expose, you do some computation, you go to the bottom of the loop, you move forward, and this notation here is meant to sort of capture this, where then the update in the middle tells you how to update the various parts of the matrix. <laughs> and we started expressing our algorithms. Sort of kind of with me? Also, we don't need to talk about index ranges. <coughs> All we need to do 
is talk about regions of the matrix that are being updated in certain fashions, and the updates that happen are themselves interesting in the algebra operations. <clears throat> All right. So this goes on. <coughs> and then we went and we wrote a bunch of papers. The first paper, journal paper, that used this notation was back in 2000, so I guess it's uh, quite a while ago. And ever since then, this is how we've been expressing our algorithms, and some people are starting to catch on. What do you take away from this? You take away from this that really algorithms should be represented in a way that captures how we reason about them. And that's what we're trying to do. And lo and behold, almost every algorithm in the dense linear algebra software stack can actually be expressed using this kind of notation or small variable. So it's very uh, appropriate notation for our domain. You, know, you could call it the domain specific language if you want, since this is a programming language. Much. Now, <clears throat> the next thing we then realized was that once we got all of this clutter out of the way, all of these indices that we had to reason about before, we actually could do what Dijkstra wanted us to do, which was to derive an algorithm like Lesky factorization hand in hand with its group of parameters. And that's really the bulk of what I'm going to talk about today. And um, we call this, you know, tongue in cheek, our weapon of math induction for the war on programming error. So how does this work? Well, let's look at this. We start by partitioning the matrix. For this particular algorithm, when we get to the top, well, the matrix is partially updated in the lower right-hand corner. Well, it's actually not updated at all, the first iteration, but that's okay. Then when we get to the bottom of the loop, we're actually done with these regions, and we're again have, have this region partially updated. We can then go to the top of the loop, and then we do it again. And what do we notice here? There is this state in which we find our matrices at the top and the bottom of the loop, before and after each iteration of the loop. What is that called? That's called the loop invariant. That's what you use to prove programs correct. The fact that you're in that state before the loop starts is your base case that you prove by induction to prove the loop correct. If you then assume that it's in that state at the top of the loop and you can prove that it's again in that state at the bottom of the loop, that's your inductive hypothesis and your induction step. We then know that by the principle of mathematical induction, the state is maintained at those points every time through the loop. Therefore, if we ever come out of the loop, we know that that state holds after we come out of the loop. And if that state then implies that you've computed the right thing, your loop is correct. All right? So. What I recognized, you know, back in the late last century, it makes me sound ancient, doesn't it? Was that I thought about these algorithms in terms of loop invariants. As a matter of fact, I could come up with different loop invariants a priori so that I could then derive an algorithm that, for example, parallelized well. People would come to me and say, I've got this algorithm I'm trying to parallelize. The traditional algorithm doesn't seem to parallelize very, very well. What am I supposed to do? And I'd go to the blackboard, I'd doodle a little bit, and I'd say, here's a different algorithm that should parallelize perfectly well. And lo and behold, an hour later, we have an implementation that parallelized really well. We'd have a lot of paper, it was wonderful. And then I made the mistake of actually thinking about what it is that I was doing, and I discovered this is what I'm doing. And then I made one more mistake, I explained it to other people, and all of a sudden, I was no longer magical. <laughs> so I'm going to explain it to you, how this all works. All right. <clears throat> This is our weapon of math induction. So shortly after the turn of the century, um, we came up with this idea of a worksheet. Okay? That really what we should do is we should present people with a worksheet into which they're going to place assertions about what must be true at different points in the loop. And then that will guide people towards what updates must happen in order to systematically derive an algorithm to be correct as we are discovering. So now pretend that you don't know any algorithms for doing Kolesky factorization, 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to systematically derive the algorithm that I just presented with some hints as to how one might be able to find other algorithms as well. You with me? So this is a filled out worksheet. And um, I guess I have a pointer somewhere. Maybe I should get that out. You start with, there's, you can see sort of a precondition here that says A has its original contents in it. At the end you say A has been overwritten by L such that L, L transpose is equal to A hat. And uh, this is the loop invariant, which is true before the loop, at the top of the loop, the bottom of the loop, and then when you come out of the loop. And this sort of structure to prove by, of your proof of correctness of the algorithm. You got it? So the yellow? So the yellow? Assertions Correct. and the white. <coughs> Correct. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Now, what we're going to find out is that we don't fill this out top down. We're going to fill this out according to the steps, numbers, step numbers on the left here. Okay. And as a matter of fact, I went ahead and created a poster so people can come down to my uh, pod <coughs> or our pod and actually go and doodle with this and derive algorithms all you want. And this is wet erase, so you can just erase it and start over. And I expect all of you to gather a few hours after this talk. So if you can check the time, you run out of time. You, know you got it? So I could talk you through why this proves the algorithm correct, but that's not what Dijkstra would want me to do. Dijkstra would want me to say, Look how I can derive the algorithm to, to be correct by filling out this worksheet. All right, so let's get started. <clears throat> so this worksheet structured the derivation of the algorithm hand in hand with its proof of correctness. I would have liked to have had a picture of an approving Dijkstra. I don't think such a thing exists. <laughs> I didn't look at that part. Okay, but I'd like to think that you've got, you know, that, that my esteem had gone up slightly in his eyes, which wouldn't be very hard. I think that he didn't have particularly high esteem when uh, he was a faculty member here. Okay, here's a blank worksheet. And as a matter of fact, um, because things get kind of small, you may want to look at these. Yeah. Just kind of hand those out, <coughs> you can follow along. On the back is the empty worksheet. If you're really ambitious, you can try to jot down everything as we go along. Um, I think if we did that, we would go a little bit too uh, slowly. So, um, oh, sorry. I'm going to use some very slow slides instead. Okay, it's not that important if you get it the empty worksheet. <coughs> so, where do you start? Well, you start, of course where you should start, which is define what the precondition is, define what's in the matrix when we get started. And we're going to always use a hat to indicate the original contents because we're going to be overwriting A as we go along. And then we have the post condition where you say A holds L, where L, L transpose is the A hat. So one thing you already notice is that, hey, shouldn't you have really indicated that L is a lower triangular matrix, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Well, a lot of those details make it so that what we do doesn't fit in the worksheet. And therefore, we're going to play a little bit loose with that. Okay, so L, lower triangle matrix. Get used to it. All right? Otherwise, things will get too messy. <clears throat> okay, so what do you do? You place that at the top. A has its original contents. At the bottom, you'd like for A to be overwritten by L, such that L transpose L where L, L transpose equals to the original contents of the A. Now we know what it is that we want to compute. Everything else is going to flow from this. Okay? If we do what Dijkstra wants us to do right, then everything we do beyond this is prescribed. Okay? <coughs> everything that we do is prescribed. We should be able to automate it, right? But that's next. Yeah. Robert, how do I read something like A equals L? Okay. At the end, so this is an assertion, so this evaluates the true. So when we're done, A should be equal to L, and L, L transpose should equal to the original contents of A. No, that's right, but there's a usual fun in programming languages between values and locations. 
So do I think about A as a name for <coughs> a set of locations that I'm going to call an array, or is it the value? Yeah, you could do that. Maybe this is why I don't come to, to this lunch often enough, and therefore I don't think that way. But you know, this is a matrix. I think of it as a matrix. You can think of it as, since we're overriding it, I guess it better be an array. We should have these discussions more often so that I can actually sharpen what I say. <clears throat> okay, for the moment, just kind of, you, you, you can make what I do more precise later. Um, kind of go with the flow. Okay, so, array A, fine. What do we know? As we compute, we're going to very systematically slide through the matrix. Okay, that's sort of one thing that is common in lots of matrix algorithms, is that you, you march through the matrix in a systematic way. In this case, because L is triangular, you want to identify these different quadrants because then L top right can be the zero uh, block that we don't need to compute with, um, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so we take our matrix A, we take our matrix L, we partition it where the thick line tells us where in the matrix we are at a typical point in our loop, as our loop executes. And then what do we do? Well, then what we would say is, well, in terms of these different regions of the array, of the matrix that have been exposed, what do we in the end need to compute? And how do we do that? Well, we take the partition matrices, we, we plug them, we substitute them into the post condition. So this is just the same thing except expressed in terms of these regions that we're going to encounter. And then if you apply the rules of linear algebra, you come up with this expression right here, which if you look very carefully at it, is really a recursive definition of Kolesky factorization. Okay, and we call that the partitioned matrix expression, which really is going to drive everything. So here's the idea. The partition matrix expression, by the way, here we can do one more manipulation. And this here actually expresses a little bit better that you update the right hand, the, the lower right corner, and then you have to do a Kolesky factorization of the result of that. And there's your Okay, so here's the idea. The partition matrix expression tells you every computation that must be performed with these different regions. What would happen if we chose the partition matrix expression to be our loop invariant? really say when we come into the loop we already have computed everything. And you can imagine that not much would happen in our loop other than that we would slide through the matrices, right? <coughs> but it would mean that we would have to initialize our matrix before we come into the loop in such a way that you've already computed what you want to compute. Ah, that's, that's not good, right? So the point I'm trying to make is, look, the loop invariant captures a partial computation towards the final result as opposed to the final result that you're trying to compute, right? So, hmm, it would make sense to stare hard at this partition matrix expression and say, hmm, let's just not do some of these computations yet on the assumption that they will happen as we slide through it, through the matrix, and then maybe we can systematically come up with different loop invariants. Okay. So, so, how the, so the, this partition operation Always mm -hmm. assumes that the upper left is just a single scalar. No, so this is this is just the partitioning of a typical state encountered so by the loop. Arbitrary, it be arbitrary. It's an arbitrary, except that the top left must be a square matrix okay. because you want to track the bottom. Okay. Thank you. All right, everybody else okay? <clears throat> so, so for example, here is our partitioned matrix expression. It captures all the computation that must be performed. We could say, well, what if we take our current state of A to be that you've computed the final result L top left and the final result L bottom left, but the bottom right part has only been partially updated towards the final result. Remember, you want to update the bottom right part, and then you still need to do the Kolesky factorization of the result of that. We'll simply say, well, we'll just assume that that has not yet been done. What I've just done is I've very systematically created a loop invariant. 
And then I can do what Dijkstra wanted us to do, which is come up with the loop invariant a priori, before I've even done the algorithm, and then derive the algorithm that corresponds to that loop invariant, so that I end up with a correct algorithm. You with me? Okay, so how does that work? Well, there are actually four, three different loop invariants that you can systematically um, derive from the partition matrix expression. And, you know, there are rules for how to do that. You look at, um, you, you do a dependence analysis because that tells you what regions must be computed for what other regions, etc. But let's not get into that. Okay? What we're going to do is we're going to take this last loop invariant and we're going to use it to derive, to derive our algorithm. Yes? Notationally, what do you mean by these hatched out error, uh, expressions? It's not yet computed or not needed. Okay, so those are values that you don't have to have for your you don't have to have it. But the statement you have will eventually be true. Correct. Why is that? Because eventually our thick lines will march through the matrix so that these are empty. <coughs> and once those are empty, you end up with your post condition. Yeah? So in the actual loop invariant that you use, these sort of cross hatched out um, areas are just a true formula. I mean, I don't mean that those expressions are true, but I mean that you write true there, so you don't have to actually check anything. I'd have to think about that. I don't think so, because, no, I don't think so, yeah. because yeah. The, when you change the, the thick lines, <clears throat> the difference in the invariant gives you the algorithm, you need the bottom right part for that. I'm not doing a very good job thinking on, on the spot. Let's get back to the layer, okay? okay. <clears throat> So, here are the three loop invariants in terms of the regions and how they've been updated. We're going to pick this one right here. You with me? So, what do we do? We go to our worksheet and we fill in this condition at the places where it must be true. It must be true before the loop starts because then the first time you get into the loop it will be true. We're going to want to derive an algorithm such that if it's true before the, the iteration, it will again be true after the iteration. Then we can employ the principle of mathematical induction to say, oh, this will always be true before and after each iteration. <coughs> Eventually, some condition is going to kick us out of the loop, at which point our loop invariant is true immediately after the loop. And then if this condition, together with the fact that you're no longer in the loop, implies that we've computed the right thing, then our algorithm is correct. Got it? So if this is induction, that there's got to be some sense of direction, right? That upper correct. left hand is getting bigger or smaller, and it can go either way? It could go either way for some operations. <coughs> For classic factorization, it has to go in a certain direction because of the dependence between the different regions and how they are updated. So, how do you express which way it's going? We'll, we'll get there. Okay. Okay? So, now, so what do we have? We have the, the post condition that, that dictated what the partitioned matrix expression had to be. We now have the partitioned matrix expression that gives us a set of loop invariants from which we can choose so that we can come up with an algorithm. The next thing we want to do is figure out what that condition is that keeps us in the loop. So I'm homing in now at the bottom. I've just taken this here and highlighted it. And what do we know? We would like for the loop invariant together with the fact that this condition is no longer true to imply that um, we've computed the correct thing. Well, if you think about it, as soon as we've slid through the entire matrix, we're good, right? So from that, you can sort of concoct this condition that keeps you in the loop. And notice that the loop invariant together with the post condition dictates what that condition has to be, although it may not be unique. In this particular case, you want to stay in the loop I don't think it, well, this kind of in words says it. If you look carefully here, 
it should be no longer true that the size of the top left part of A is less than the size of A. So as long as the top left part is less than the side of A, then we want to stay in the loop, and that's building up there, and that also means that if you pass that condition, it will be right here. All right, but notice that the loop invariant and the post condition dictate what that condition should be. All right? So next, we want to initialize. Well, we know that A originally has its original contents. We know that we want to get into a, a situation where the loop invariant is true. Obviously, we need to somehow partition the matrix because otherwise this doesn't have any meaning. <clears throat> and what you notice is that we should take our matrix A, partition it into quadrants, same with L. Initially, if you take your top left of A to be empty, then A bottom right is all of this. These are empty matrices, so when you subtract it off, nothing happens, and therefore you say that A bottom right has its original contents in it, but that is implied by the fact that the precondition is. Right? Now, this also starts giving a hint as to how you want to go through the matrix, because this here tells you that you want to initialize with the thick lines on the left and the top, and obviously you want to finish with them all the way at the end. Yes? So this is <coughs> the correct thing to, to come up with in terms correct. of the initialization, but aren't there other possibilities they could have chosen? Is that sort of what you're missing out by not saying it's in lower triangular, and et cetera, et cetera? Mm, no. I mean, uh, what you could have done is you could have said, well, let's not take the top left to be 0 by 0. Let's take it to be 1 by 1. And if you do that, then some other computation would have to happen here. So you could say this is the simplest initialization that you've come up with. You'd like to not do any computation here. What other computation would be needed? I guess so. uh, then you would have to take the square root of the top left corner, you would have to update something below it, because you somehow want to get into this state. And you've already <laughs> marched through the matrix slide. So some computation would have had to have happened. Oh, I see. So L is, right, so L is like the predetermined, we already know what, the L doesn't appear in the actual algorithm. Correct. But L only appears in the specification, and it's, it is what we want to have in the end. Yes, yes. The exactly. Position, and so exactly. that's why. Exactly. Yeah. Sure. Yes, I should have made it clear. Thank you. All right, so you fill that in there. You start to see things are starting to fill up. <coughs> Next comes exactly what, what Kelvin alluded at. Somehow we need to march through the matrix. And how are we going to do that? Well, we kind of notice that we need to start with A top left being empty. And then the loop guard tells us that we need to finish with A top left being the entire matrix. So we better start making <coughs> progress towards that. And the way we express that is by saying, take our current partitioned matrix and peel off an extra row and an extra column so that we can do some computation with it and then at the bottom move that extra row and extra column across the thick line so that we move forward. All right. And that's sort of where our notation motivated how we might want to do this. All right. So you take that and you put it into the um, Worksheet. And now we're starting to get somewhere, right? <coughs> I think you have a question, Robert. Yes. Oh, oh yes. Uh, just another no notational thing. The single lines here mean that it's a single row. So you're saying that gamma 1, 1 is always going to be a single element and L, L1, 0 is going to be a single element. So actually, these could oh. be blocks. And for performance, you might want to pick those to be blocks. Gotcha. And one of the com uh, notational conventions is that if it's a lowercase Greek letter, that indicates a scalar. I see, I didn't notice the specific thing. Great that you're asking all these questions because it clarifies it. Okay, so now we say, okay, we, we must be in the state where the loop invariant is true at the top of the loop. All we're doing here is really an indexing step. We're exposing new regions. We can ask ourselves, in terms of these regions that we expose, what is in our matrix? What is in these different regions? And that's a matter of taking this, doing a textual substitution, and doing some linear algebra manipulation. As a matter of fact, you take your loop invariant, 
you look at how the matrices are repartitioned, notice that, for example, A bottom right now becomes this submatrix right here. You take that and you plug it into the loop invariant. You get all of this. Then you do some linear algebra manipulation. And you get that right there after you repartition, this is what is in different parts of the matrix. Notice that it's prescribed. Textual substitution, rules of linear algebra. Right? And you take that, you place it into your worksheet, and now you know in what state all of those different variables are, and all those different regions of the matrix, of the array. Now, at the bottom, we want to again be in the state where the loop invariant is true. We know that we redefine what these different regions are, so we can do textual substitution of what you know, how the quadrants are created from the different pieces. This here, you substitute for A top left here and various other places. Textual substitution, linear algebra manipulation, and what you find out is what must be in these different parts of the matrix in order for the loop invariant to again be true at the bottom of the loop. Okay, so how you march through the matrix together with the loop invariant dictates what must be true at this particular point. Okay. And now you're there. You know what is in the different parts of the matrix. You know what you want to be in the different parts of the matrix. You do a compare and contrast, and you figure out what the updates must be. Okay. <clears throat> That's what's in the matrix. This is what you want to be there. If you, for example, track what must be in alpha 1, 1, you want lambda 1, 1 to be in alpha 1, 1, but this is the constraint on what computes uh, lambda 1, 1. So really lambda 1, 1, okay? But we know that up there, alpha 1, 1 already contains this minus that. So, Yes, we want alpha 1, 1 to hold this. Uh, sorry, we want afterwards uh, for alpha 1 to hold lambda 1, 1. We know this constraint right here that tells us that we want to take the square root of this expression right here. But that expression right there already uh, exists in alpha 1, 1. And therefore, really, all we need to do is take the square root of alpha 1. And you can do that for all of the different regions to figure out how they must be. <coughs> okay, there's a little bit of dependence analysis you probably want to do because you want to update them in, in, in a smart order. But those are details. But, but that's a becomes. Huh? That's a becomes instead of becomes. Oh, yeah. Usually we have a coding equals here. So, so Rob, what does a blank empty boxes mean? Blank empty boxes in the worksheet? Yeah. Yet to be filled out. OK. So now we know what the update must be. And now we update that. The orange highlights what we just updated. And we have derived what the update must be. And you notice that every step was prescribed. Okay. Therefore, you know that this is a correct algorithm. Because you know it's a correct algorithm, you don't even need to implement it because you know it's correct. <laughs> right? And then what you do is you take away all of the assertions that only were there to prove that the algorithm was correct. And then you take away the entire worksheet and you're left with it. Wait, wait, so I don't, the blank, the blank boxes were never filled in. Black boxes. You just mean the blank boxes in the... Go back, go back, go back. Look, look at and step two. Here? Oh, right. Yeah. Now this was just, these were constraints that weren't needed. So just no constraints. Yeah, I'm okay. sorry, I didn't know that's what you were talking about. I could have just had them as these constraints right here. Okay. But I like having this here because it tells you where the constraints came from in the okay. matrix. So I, I take it that when you have those boxes, when you have a matrix layout with constraints, it's actually kind of a conjunction. Logically, it's just a conjunction yes. of those, of exactly. the constraints inside the, the matrix Correct. layout. It's, this must be true. So no, really, it's this must be equal to that, and this must be equal to that, and yeah. What I'm talking about is actually and then and this must be true, and this must be true. Yeah, that true. that was the the notation. Absolutely. 
You got it? So you take away the assertions, you're left with the algorithm. And the algorithm is correct. And you don't go home. Now the problem, of course, is that just because you express the algorithm this way when you then translate it into code, there's still plenty of opportunity to introduce bugs, right? So what do you do? Well, you come up with an API that allows your code to look exactly like this, so that in translating it to code, you minimize the uh, opportunity to introduce bugs. Okay, and for that, we have, so before we do that, we can repeat for all of the other loop invariants. You can read a bunch of papers about this. <coughs> We even got one into formal aspects of computing. Formal methods, people seem to like it. Actually got really good reviews. And then the important thing is that we can come up with multiple algorithms. We can do lots of algorithms which allow you to express computation in terms of matrix matrix multiplied, which can achieve really high performance. And given the architecture, we can then choose the best algorithm for the architecture. And that way, we can often beat the performance that other people have in their library. Right. So, the next thing is how do you then code it up? I'm going to speed things up a little bit. What we actually have is we have a web page where you fill out different parts. So if you want to implement the Koleski factorization, you say Koleski unblocked, this was variant number three. You only have one matrix that you march through from top left to bottom right. This is the MATLAB API for implementing it. And if you put this next to the algorithm, let's see if we can do that. No. If you put it next to the algorithm, going because we're going to run out of time. <coughs> the important thing is that what we essentially did was we create code that looks very much like this so that it's easy to translate. What you notice that this, this and this is just indexing. That's where people make their mistakes. So we actually have a web page that auto-generates that part. And then all someone has to do by hand is fill in, translate this into whatever subroutine calls methods uh, operations uh, are necessary to achieve that, and bingo, you end up with a correct algorithm implemented correctly that gives the right answer the first time. Okay. And I do this with undergraduates. And they get the right answer the first time, even though they don't know what they're computing. Okay. Well, that then, of course, means that um, you should be able to automate this. So, uh, about 10 years ago, Paolo Biantonese, who was a uh, graduate student here, as a small part of his dissertation, actually wrote an automated system in Mathematica to do this automatically. So let's see how this happens automatically. Okay? He made a short video for us so that we can watch this happen. Hello. I take it over from here. I want to show you that what the methodology that Robert has been uh, talking about can be fully um, automated. Um, as a matter of fact, Robert mentioned several times that uh, the whole methodology is fully prescribed. However, in, in his presentation there was a little bit of a hand waving and uh, uh, several times he said that uh, he it would leave some uh, details behind, hidden, because uh, uh, they would be tedious and the formulas would become so large that they would not fit on the screen. And uh, so, um, first, uh, when I was a PhD student, I started working on automation, and then uh, one of my doctoral students, Diago Fabregat, took over, and he really 
uh, went ahead and took care of all the minute details and uh, he also um, encoded a good amount of uh, uh, numerical linear algebra of, of, sorry of linear algebra rules um, and put them into Mathematica. So now let me show you that uh, uh, this system, this is an interface um, uh, that connects to a, a Mathematica server in back in Germany and as I said this Mathematica server knows this flame methodology that Robert uh, presented and it knows also uh, quite a bit of linear algebra. Let's see what we can do. If I uh, since you have I've heard about the Cholesky factorization. Let me go ahead and uh, show how it can be automated. So there are two operands, uh, one input and one output. Uh, L is an output, sorry about that. And it's a matrix and it's lower triangular. And then we have a matrix A, which is an input matrix. And we know it's a symmetric positive definite. Okay, the operation that we want to uh, perform is L times L transpose and we want that to, to equal A. So this is everything that a system needs to know and in fact this is everything that an expert would start with. Okay, I ask, I press OK, the equation which is described by this uh, Precondition and postcondition has been shipped to a Mathematica server. The first step was to automatically generate the partition matrix expression. Here it is. As you can see, there is only one for this specific operation. And from this partition matrix operation, uh, three loop invariants were identified. The first one is uh, then translated, transformed into an algorithm and as I loop over the loop invariance, the uh, algorithms, the implementation uh, changes. And I want to show you that um, if we click on details, all those uh, details that Robert was talking about, so the loop invariant at the top of the loop, so, uh, sorry, before the loop and then at the top of the loop and then at the bottom of the loop all these, all, all these uh, uh, predicates are uh, shown and uh, it's then from the difference between these two predicates that the updates are uh, described. Okay, so this is it for the Cholesky factorization. I want to show you that we can tackle significantly more involved equations. So I will talk about the Sylvester equation. Syl, just to shorten, Sylvester. There. Okay, here we have four operands. We have a couple of triangular matrices, let's call them A and B. Then we have general matrix and the unknown matrix. So A is, let's say, lower triangular, B, let's also set it as lower triangular, C is just the general matrix, and X is the output matrix. And the Sylvester equation is defined like this, Ax plus Xb equals C. Once again, this is all the knowledge that is necessary to specify the equation, and it's all the knowledge that uh, the uh, symbolic system takes as input. Okay, the equation was a little bit more complicated, so it took a little bit longer. Here you go, this is the definition of uh, the input, so the precondition and postcondition. Now the important things to, thing to notice is that we don't have only one partition matrix expression, but we have uh, three of them. So one, and for this one we identify two loop invariants, second partition matrix expression, two more loop invariants, and then third partition matrix expression corresponding to a 2 by 2 partitioning of the matrix C and, uh, and X and for this you have, uh, we have 16 uh, loop invariants and uh, as we traverse, as we march through these uh, uh, loop invariants you see that uh, the algorithm is automatically uh, updated. Okay, um, 
to show what was going on under the cover, you see that these are the uh, algorithms, loop invariants, and the PMEs that uh, um, came from uh, Mathematica's server. Let's see if I go up. I think that this is the no. Uh, yeah, this is still all the formulas. I wanted to show you the um, input, the expression that was sent to the here you go, yes. So this is what we sent to the Mathematica server, what we inputted, and then uh, all those pages, all this garbage right here is the encoding of uh, all these algorithms. And from uh, the exact same encoding, we can uh, either represent uh, algorithms like this or generate C and MATLAB code. Okay, I'm gonna stop with this and pass and pass it over to Robert again. Thank you. This is what we do as computer scientists. We automate, right? A um, bunch of papers about that. Um, we actually can, so in, in, in numerical analysis, there's a different notion of correctness because Radloff error gets in the way. And what you do in order to show that uh, a code is correct, you have to do a backward error analysis. And we've actually shown how these techniques can be extended to automatically, no, to systematically come up with backward error analyses, although this has not been yet made uh, automatic, but in principle we can. Um, another student went one step further and said, well, what if you want to systematically derive an algorithm to have a certain property, for example, a certain performance property? You can actually identify loop invariants that will have the desired property so that you just derive the algorithm that will have that property. And that actually sidesteps the whole phase ordering problem of trying to transform one algorithm into another that has that property. <clears throat> um, so the conclusion is uh, we've actually managed to make goal-oriented programming for uh, loop-based algorithms uh, practical. We believe we're the only ones to have done that. Um, industry actually cares about this. So we actually have libraries based, that we have created based on these techniques that are competitive with what the industry put out. And as a result, now industry collaborates with us. Uh, there are lots of extensions yet to be explored. And if you are wondering, can I do this in my area as well, start with really nice notation. It helps a lot. And then finally, can we arm the world with weapons of mass induction? And to achieve that, uh, I'm going to teach a course this fall called Programming for Correctness and Performance to undergraduates. And uh, Maggie and I, who's sitting over there, are planning a massive open online course on programming for correctness where we will introduce the world to these uh, ideas. All right, I'll take questions. I'll we'll turn on the light. There are two meta level questions. Correct. One is Have you considered using recursion as a way of specifying the <coughs> algorithm and then converting the recursion into iteration? So well, that's exactly what we do because the partition matrix expression is a recursive definition of the operation. And what this methodology does is it, it does automatically come up with the iteration. No, I, I, I understand that. You, know, you can convert tail recursion into iteration. And so on. What I'm saying is, in your worksheet, right, mm -hmm. have you considered having worksheets where you just write the recursive code, and then that's automatically converted into loops and so on? And I'm just wondering whether that might be uh, cleaner. I'm not sure if I entirely understand. Um, are you really saying, uh, have we considered? creating a compiler that will look at each sub-operation by looking at the uh, recursive definition of it and will then automatically come up with the loop invariants and then the yeah. algorithm. In principle, we could do that. In practice, we have not. Okay. In practice, I live in this world where people want libraries, and therefore we layer this in libraries. But in practice, you know, 
ideally, this is exactly what you would do. You would custom make, you know, you, you would derive an algorithm, you would end up with sub-operations for which you may not have an implementation. You would recursively define this, um, apply this to come up with implementations of that. And in the end, you would end up with primitives. And at that point, you could have a correct algorithm. Absolutely. We're not there yet, but you know, I always sort of pose the question, had we come up with this notation and this methodology 40 years from now, what would the compiler community have brought to the table to really make this work by now? Because after all, it's, it's a bunch of numerical analysts putzing around with programming languages issues and compilers and stuff like that. We probably could use some help. <coughs> And then the other question is, uh, you're wedded to an imperative language here. Mm -hmm. So your A equals L, which still sort of throws me off here. Mm -hmm. you know, it's uh, actually a constraint programming language, right? Well, I'm not sure what it is. <laughs> okay. but, uh, I'm wondering whether, have you considered uh, using something like a functional language to describe the algorithm and then have that
uh, be translated to an imperative language? Well, that in some sense, easier? you could say that's exactly what Paolo did because uh, Mathematica uses a functional programming language, and he can actually come up with Mathematica algorithms from this as well. So, in some sense, that's actually what happened when the covers. No, but then we won't try things like A to Z, so. Hmm? Okay, we, we talk about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would say it's more like constraint program, because we're, we're giving the constraints on what you want from your operands. And that then dictates what computation must happen, and I think Gordon would probably agree with that, right? I mean, this is, it's a little more like constraint program. You know, J.C. Brown used to want to do that as well. Okay. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, <clears throat> So, so usually when you're doing this, um, you know, your first attempt at getting an invariant is too weak and you have to strengthen the invariant, you know, it's a kind of iterative process. And I, maybe it went by too quickly, but somehow you went from the PME to the invariant yes. in just one spell swoop almost. Yeah, and there's a little bit of magic that happens there, because what you really even want to do is you want to look at the PME, you want to look at the uh, dependence between uh, the various operands that are there. That then dictates in what order you can sort of strike sub-operations out. And that then yields the feasible loop invariance that will actually give you a valid algorithm. Another way possible, you know, one way that I teach it to undergraduates because this is a little too complicated is I sort of say, well, just make a big table of every possible way in which it can strike out sub-operations. Some of those will actually yield loop invariants that will yield an actual algorithm. With some of them, you'll just try to derive, and you'll find out that somewhere along the way, something breaks down, and then you go on to the next loop invariant, which is more the trial and error that you described. So is it, is, it, is it characteristic of the fact that you're operating on matrices that allows you to do that? If this was a oh, absolutely. kind of computation, I mean, notice that we're working with matrices. Because we're working with matrices, we get all kinds of nice things. Okay? We get all the rules of linear algebra. Okay? We get uh, the fact that you can march through matrices in different directions, which then gives you different uh, partition matrix expressions and also gives you lots of different algorithms for each of those partition matrix expressions. So, yeah, this is, this is a wonderful sandbox in which to work. And then on top of that, industry cares because they want high-performing algorithms and the different algorithms will have different, um, typically they, they perform the same operations, but they may have different properties when it comes to moving data between cache layers and therefore you may get very different performance characteristics for the different algorithms. So, yeah, I mean, we kind of happen to be working in the ideal area uh, in which to apply this. And then, of course, the question becomes, well, what else could you do, right? What other domains can you take this to? Um, I'm not too well up on this, but, but I know there's been work on, on uh, using uh, SMT solvers to uh, automatically infer invariants. Have you, have you looked at that? I have not looked at that. <coughs> uh, uh, yeah, I don't know how much success that has. So pe people have said, if you have an algorithm, how do you infer the loop invariant that underlies it? That's a really hard problem. Okay? Saying, coming up with loop invariants from which to then derive correct algorithms is much easier and more productive. So I would argue that those people probably are looking at the wrong problem. Uh, no, I don't think they're selling to an algorithm. I think they are really trying to infer loop invariants given uh, a basic, you start, I think they have a basic uh, idea of what your loop might look like. Mm -hmm. They've got an idea of, of, of the goal, and then basically systematic research is a whole space to come up with, with the invariants. But I think they have to do fixed, fixed loop panels, I think. That's one thing, I'm not that well up on what they do, but I just know. Yeah, so we, we've looked around, and the thing is, what, what trips most people up is that they express their algorithms at the low level with all of these nasty indices into arrays. And that makes it so much harder than when you recognize that you're really dealing with regions and therefore the notation just gives you so much more power. So it all starts with coming up with the right notation for the domain where you're trying to apply this.